Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session. Today we will talk about language perception and comprehension. What we have done till now that in the previous session we talked about navigation in the real and virtual space and uh, we saw what kind of cognitive processes are involved. Basically when we say navigation we say there are cognitive processes and locomotion both are involved. So how we perceive that world and how we move around in that world is what has was understood. Now basically the navigational consideration involves appropriate shared frame of reference that supports giving and responding to instructions effectively. And then we talked about a virtual ruler that provides a useful approach toward representing augmented and uh, virtual reality as two opposite extremes of a continuum. Now, before this we had talked about uh, the displays, uh, visual displays particularly. So the cognitive processes there were basically involved in terms of the perception of space and also movement in space and cognition of space. In today's session, we will be talking about language and how we process language and how the various findings in cognitive psychology can be used to develop certain guidelines for manuals, giving instructions for example, and uh, what kind of language should be used and uh, what kind of sentences should be structured there. So after this session, you should be able to describe word recognition on the basis of bottom-up and top-down processes. Basically, when we read text, for example, we are involved in the process of giving meaning to whatever sentences, etc. we read, and it is important that we recognize words, and then we integrate those words in a certain way, and finally arrive at the meaning. And during reading the text, uh, eyes move in a certain way. So we'll be looking at these eye movements uh, for reading a text and how to arrive at meaning can be explained on the basis of an approach called hypothesis testing. So basically this model will suggest, the hypothesis testing model will suggest that while we read, then we develop certain propositions and we integrate these propositions over a p over say further reading as the sentence is read further and then we combine those propositions. And earlier propositions propose certain hypotheses that we test with new propositions that are formed in that particular sentence. So that is how we arrive at the meaning finally. So then we look at uh, sentence processing in terms of bottom up and top down processes. So basically we'll see how the context uh, data trade off occurs. Bottom up processing involves data in the form of words, features of words, words uh, which are formed on the basis of letters and then finally the sentences and context given is the entire context in which the text appears. So context will be there for each word or each sentence and etc. and finally it is the broad context that is created by the entire text. And then on the basis of these uh, make guidelines for an instruction manual for a system. Now when uh, we read text, then how do we get at the meaning? That is the basic thing, uh, basic question we should ask. Most models of word recognition, they suggest how the activation at lower levels, lower levels means the printed words are where we, lower levels would mean the features that constitute each letter and then how the letters uh, create words and so on. Uh, they lead to the activation at higher levels. So sentence meaning, as we can see, 
starts at the bottom with feature recognition. And then from feature recognition, it moves over to letter recognition, to word recognition, and then we arrive at the meaning of the sentence. So recognition plays an important role. We have talked about recognition uh, in sensory processes and in perceptual processes. And basically what we are saying is as we move from feature recognition to sentence meaning, then some kind of automation may be involved at some stage because we don't just stop after reading a particular word and we don't try to look at its meaning. Uh, things become more automatic with experience. And uh, there is the one of the initial models was called pande the pandemonium model, uh, which suggested that when there are certain features in the for when text is written, then there are certain uh, you know, demons which extract features from the written text. And for each feature, there is a demon. And depending upon the intensity or the relevance, et cetera, of a particular feature in a particular text, that particular demon starts shouting uh, louder. And then uh, there are cognitive demons and decision demon and so on. So that was one of the initial models. And most of the models of sentence meaning or uh, word recognition, they are based on this kind of approach, basically. So let us look at this uh, particular approach. Let's say uh, there is a word, work. How do we recognize the word work, which is at the top of this particular figure? So what is suggested is that uh, we get a work as a stimulus in the written text. So in the entire sentence, somewhere there is this word work. And then uh, we work is analyzed into these features. You know, There are various features which are available. And this, so feature analysis is the first stage. From feature analysis, features are combined to go to the level of letter analyzers. And here, for example, uh, for K, we are taking this as a particular letter that is being recognized here. In K, we have these three features. And then, uh, so these three features, we can see this K has these three basic features. And that K can be analyzed into these features. Now, of course, one can ask that these features are also there in a triangle in the letter uppercase letter A. For example, uh, the uppercase letter A also has uh, those features. And if there's a triangle, it also has those features. So how does one make this distinction between K and triangle? That we'll see shortly, how from the top-down processing, one gets at either K or A or a triangle. So first of all, in the context of language, uh, the triangle is ruled out. We are not talking about geometrical shapes, but we are talking about the written text. So that is ruled out. And then from here, now the letter analyzer for K, that is, uh, you know, that makes a lot of intensity noise or whatever that demon makes a lot of intensity. And then uh, we see the word analyzer as work. And finally, we perceive the word as work. So this is the bottom-up process. From data to feature analysis to letter analysis, or data means stimulus, and then to word analyzers, and finally to the word. In the top-down process, the context and redundancy plays an important role. We talked about redundancy in the session on information processing, uh, information theory. Basically, in redundancy, we use more channels or more words to give smaller information. Now, um, so bottom-up processes are in the, from bottom to top, and top-down processes are from top to bottom. And the, uh, you know, the word shape, for example, is an uh, indicator of what this letter could be. Uh, you know, in, in analyzing words, 
For example, uh, there are in any word, there may be ascenders, descenders, and half line letters. So if we have a word like minimum, all these letters in the word minimum are half line letters. But if we have a word like quit, then there are dis there's a descender and there's an ascender. So going below the middle line or going above the middle line. So uh, that is the distinction between the ascenders, descenders, and half line letters. Now for proofreaders, this can pose a real difficulty, you know. So uh, detecting a spelling error in minimum, for example, is much more difficult for the proofreader as compared to in quick. So word shape somehow helps in uh, you know, uh, word analysis. And uh, that is, so if we write everything in all capital letters, uppercase letters, or et cetera, you know, then that can be difficult to read, for example. Then automaticity. Basically, when we are moving from the bottom up in direction, then uh, automaticity is involved. And uh, we have already seen how skills become automatized, where you know, extensive practical training or experience is important. And here, familiarity with the word and particular text in which that particular word occurs is present. And then finally, visual search. We also looked at visual search processes in perception, uh, attention particularly. And then, uh, so there's a visual search. When the sentence is there, the visual search is there. So there's a scanning of the sentence, and we search for particular words. So how does perception of printed word occur? Perception of printed word involves bottom-up and top-down processing. Both the processes go on uh, concurrently. And you know, they are, uh, so they converge into certain kind of final decision. Bottom-up processes are also called data-driven, and uh, which use features as units, where visual search is involved. The letter as a unit, automatic processing is there and the word as a unit, where word shape is important. So these three uh, processes are important at different levels. So we can think of these analyzers as, as located at uh, different hierarchical levels. Then top-down processing, uh, how we come from the top to the bottom, expectancy or context in which a word occurs. You know, that will uh, give us the correct recognition of the word. You know, there can be interesting examples. For example, if I say chocolate and ice cream, ice cream in the dark. So chocolate and ice creams, we immediately know that ice cream is the ice cream to be eaten. Ice cream in the dark is probably representing what I experience when I'm present in the dark. So I scream. And so the two uh, things are very different. And the context in which ice cream is appearing, that makes it clear what uh, we are talking about. So expectancy, uh, context driven, uh, when we write a word, for example, uh, say in writing the word Q, for example. Uh, so Q, U, E is a more, most likely combination of words. So the expectancy that this particular letter will appear, it has high probability of occurrence. So by expectancy, we mean we mean high probability that a particular alternative is present. And then it is context driven. Context, I've given the example of ice cream and chocolate, for example. Then redundancy. So with the help of redundancy, uh, we can also reach correct decision. Because redundancy means that uh, either there are multiple inputs uh, through different modalities, or that uh, more number of words are used to give the same information. And we uh, looked while talking about information theory that English language is about 70% redundant. Then there is word superiority effect. You know, So word uh, is, d dominates. It has a superior position. And so word will influence the perception. Now, in so in word perception, basically, we can see that uh, these are the uh, processes. Uh, say from stimulus, the bottom of process are processes are that from stimulus we go to features, and then features and stimulus both lead to letters, 
and then stimulus and letters lead to words. This is the bottom of processing. This is bottom of processing is happening. And particularly, uh, this uh, level is the level of analysis. And here, this is called uh, unitization. You know, at this level, there's something called unitization. You know, unitization is a process of achieving automation in processing. And unitization permits or helps in binding the features together. So there is some kind of process that binds these features together to give rise to a meaningful word. Uh, so a distinction between word and non-word can be made, for example, uh, from the context. And uh, this is how the process go on. And the top-down processes will happen at uh, all levels. You know, words, for example, have a top-down process in letters. So Q, E, E, for example, how this word influences what letter is most likely to occur there. And then it can also affect this process from features to letters. And then uh, letters can influence features. So there is you know, all these processes. And with a lot of experience, you know, normally when we understand uh, writing in a particular text uh, language, then over a period of time, this pro these processes become automatic. They don't interfere. And they all go in parallel. And finally, we are able to uh, achieve the meaning of the word. Now, this is an example of the uh, context. You know, this is the, the same shape is read as H in this word and read as A in this word. So it is the or cat. And, but shape is the same. So independently, if this occurred, where it, there would be ambiguity about whether it's an H or an A. And uh, this ambiguity is disambiguated by the particular context in which the, uh, this particular shape occurs. Now, what happens in reading? In reading, uh, you know, several eye study, eye movement studies have demonstrated that when we read certain text, eyes move in a certain way. And there are two particular processes. One is eye fixation, and the other is second. So eye fixations means that we are focusing our vision at a particular point in the sentence or particular region in the sentence. And second means we are moving. So seconds uh, are there. And then uh, you know there is something called fixation dwell time. So read it as here. There is fixation dwell time. That means how much time, for how much time we fix or we fixate our vision on a particular part of the sentence. Now, this um, sentence is an example uh, you know, where uh, how the reading is done. So when we are fixating on a particular part, so for example, here, uh, we are moving in that particular direction. We read sentence, the English language, we read from left to right. So our eyes move from left to right, and we move in that particular direction. And as we read, we fixate on a particular part of the word. So suppose at a particular point of time, we are fixating at this word, or a couple of words, depending upon the experience of the individual and the nature of the text. For example, if it's a difficult text to read, a new material, uh, you know, technical material, for example, then the region that is fixated will be smaller. Otherwise, it will be larger. So now in this particular example, it says there's 100% attention devoted or fixation point is very fixed and 100% attention is there. And the attention or the vision will be smudged for whatever we have read already and what we will read. So that doesn't interfere with this. Basically, as far as the sensory and visual attention processes are concerned, <coughs> when they are fixating on this particular verse, there's no interference from the neighboring words or distant words. So around the fixation point, only four to five letters are seen with 100% accuracy. Other letters are not seen. But generally, uh, when there are experts who have uh, read in a particular language for a long time, who have the experience of the language, you know, they don't even go to that level of analysis. And therefore, as these processes become automatic, they're able to read the word immediately in that sense. So this basically relates to acuity. 
So, fixation point is related to acuity. Uh, we have talked about acuity in the previous session. And so, acuity will bring that particular region into focus. So, we keep on reading further words, further words, and further words. So, what do I fixations do? These are fixed gazes and in which I is motionless. So, basically, there is a foveal region. Basically, at the fovea, if the image is projected at the fovea in the foveal region, then the vision is very clear and the image is very clearly obtained, can be seen. And information acquisition, that is the active process there. For an earlier part, information has already been acquired and further information will be acquired as we read the sentence further. The typical duration of a fixation is 200 to 600 milliseconds, but it can vary from 100 to 1000 milliseconds depending on the nature of the information fixated. As I said, if it is a technical new word that somebody is reading, then fixation time uh, may be longer. Otherwise, if it is a routine and uh, generally a word which has been experienced several times, then fixation time will be short. So, it is just milliseconds. Milliseconds is a very small duration. For example, this is 50 milliseconds. So, you can see that this shot is such a short time that we are not consciously aware that we are fixating and we are not consciously aware of our eye movements. Now, fixations are interspersed with saccades. So, what are saccades? Saccadic eye movements are quick jumps of the eye. So, when we say quick jumps, the eye after fixating say here, it makes a quick jump, jump from here to here, let us say. And you know this length of the jump will be more for an experienced reader, it will be more for simple text and so on. So, the distance uh, that is covered by a saccade will depend upon the nature of the material. Uh, the individual characteristic and so on. So, um, it is very fast, 700 degrees per second, you know, 700 degrees, you know, as if, you know, I can move twice around its axis uh, and that is the kind of speed. So, during second, we really do not pick up any information. We just move, uh, the eyes move very fast. And this uh, saccadic eye movement is ballistic. Once started and once a target has been set, where to set the target, then I will just go and fix it there. The, the, uh, the target cannot be changed during the second. So, basically, how will this target be set? Again, experience, difficulty of the test, it's test, etc. So, if I am reading something, I know that I am reading a difficult test, text. So, I will uh, have smaller spans of seconds and also I will uh, know that at the third or the second or the next word I should fix it. But if it is a simple, easy and uh, uh, redundancy can help me in taking care of uh, several interstitial words, grammatical words, then I can have a larger uh, jump, etc. It has a very short duration, seconds are because of that speed, it has a very short duration. So, one can sort of estimate how it comes to about 30 to 120. Uh, milliseconds for, for jumping from one uh, word to another. So, depending on the distance, the jump from here to here will depend upon the angle uh, that is made. And once this uh, speed is given, one can find out uh, how much time it will take to move. And so, depending upon the span again, it will take that much of time. Vision is suppressed during second. So, we cannot really see any letter or any word uh, during second eye movement, we cannot focus anyway. Then there is something called pursuit eye movement. Pursuit means a mo a, an object is moving and we are in pursuit of the object. Visual tracking of movement, we already discussed this uh, in uh, one of the earlier sessions. Uh, the, in tracking, there is a smooth movement of the eye. So, if there is a rotating stimulus, then if we have to keep a stimulus on that object as it rotates, then uh, we are doing tracking, but this is manual tracking. But similarly, I, ca I can track. So, uh, for example, uh, when on a TV screen, the text moves around or text does not move around, we may do, we may do, we may track moving objects. 
but it is not required for static scene. So if the scenes are static, uh, you don't require any uh, eye pursuit. Static scenes require fixation in seconds. So that is the difference. Once it is a printed text, it is fixed and therefore only fixations and saccades are relevant. But if it is a moving text, as I said, for example, on a TV screen, then the text keeps on moving and uh, we track. So we fixate, meanwhile the text has moved and if we have missed something, we move in that direction. So this uh, right movement or left movement of the eye will again depend upon whether the text is static or dynamic. Then there is something called torsional eye movement. Rotation of the eye around the viewing axis. So, uh, this, uh, so compensating uh, for body rotation to stabilize visual scene. So, for example, if body is rotated, then I may rotate my eyes, and this can be up to 15 degrees. And then vergence eye movement. Vergence is involved in depth perception, for example. At what distance does the text appear? And this is slow, smooth movement that changes the vergence angle. So this angle is called the Verges angle. For example, if uh, both the eyes fixate on an object which is near to me, then Verges angle will be larger. And the, if the object is farther away, then the Verges angle will become smaller. And how do we get the uh, notion of depth from here? That is because if the object is very near, then there will be muscular stress. And uh, because of which I know that the object is near. But when the object is very far, eye muscles are relaxed and therefore uh, at a greater distance, so when the vergence angle is small, then uh, eyes will be relaxed. Can be as high as one second. No, this can be as high as one second. Vergence execution can be interrupted. So we can stop, uh, you know, our focus uh, voluntarily. Then tremor movements, you know, these are fast and low amplitude eye movements uh, on which we don't have any control and they're always there. Uh, they, this improves the perception of high frequencies. So basically, if there's a vibrating uh, stimulus with a high frequency, then uh, that will be improved and it prevents fading of fixated images. You know, if we focus on a particular object for a longer duration, then something like sensory habituation or uh, uh, you know, that, that, that image fades because of the sensory sensitivity, uh, the, you know, the, because it is because of the actions in the neurons, for example, and activation and deactivation processes go on. And if, and a, if a neuron, if a retinal cone, for example, is activated for a longer duration, then after some time it gets tired or habituated, and therefore it will become sort of sort of blind, quote unquote blind, will not be able, to, the image will fade. And these tremors uh, just uh, take care of that. Most eye movement research focuses on the study of fixations and saccades. These movements provide information on two fronts, visual attention and gaze trajectory, as we have seen in case of the text reading. Now, what does reading do? What do we do in reading? In reading, we are engaged in several tasks, in lexical decision tasks, so whether a particular printed uh, combination of letters or string of letters form a meaningful word, a word, or a non-word. But that means whether it's available in the dictionary or not available in the dictionary. So lexicon decision means decision that is a member of the lexicon of that particular language, English language, for example. Uh, so vocabulary, lexical means uh, a vocabulary uh, whether it's a part of the meaningful vocabulary in that particular language. Then syntactic analysis of the text, uh, where grammatical categories, for example, noun phrase, verb phrase, etc., uh, that is, so this is called parsing. We parse a sentence when we are reading text, and basically we are saying that we are reading some sentences. We parse a sentence into a grammatical category. And a sentence has to be grammatically correct before we can really get to the correct meaning. Uh, but grammatical correctness is not a sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. Uh, there are many examples which Chomsky has given where you know, ambiguity might be there in interpreting a sentence. 
grammatically correct. So, colorless, green, ideas, sleep silently or peacefully. Now, the colorless and green is some kind of uh, antagonistic to each other. They are there, they do not gel well. Sentence is grammatically correct, but it is not meaningful because the combination of words is not meaningful. Then, semantic interpretation of the message carrying meaning based on propositions. So, basically, grammatical categories are at the level of syntactic analysis, <coughs> from where we extract certain propositions. A proposition is an affirmative statement that is a truth value, true or false. So, and generally, therefore, what we are saying is that uh, many a time when we appear in some exam, uh, it says there is a proposition. So, proposition may be that you know some men are women, other than this is wrong in the universe. But this is a proposition, and so proposition is a kind of an assumption in a given situation. And then we test that assumption with more propositions, and we find out whether given this assumption, this proposition, does another proposition hold good? Does it hold? So, a situation is given, and when we say a proposition is a truth value, it is in comparison with that situation. So, and the reader is involved in a hypothesis testing task to arrive at the meaning of the sentence. Just to give an example, uh, suppose you have a cross and a circle. So, cross is above the circle is a proposition. It is affirmative. It has a truth value. So, this proposition is true. It has a truth value. Cross is above the circle. But if cross is, if I say circle is above the cross, then this proposition is not true. So, this uh, not, the use of not or a circle is above is, a, is not a proposition in this context. And uh, use of, if I say the circle is not above the cross, there is some kind of a proposition, but now it is using a negative sentence. So, how will negativization of a sentence, interrogation of in a sentence, etcetera, how will they affect processing of sentences is also important, because all this will lead to development of important guidelines for um, system manuals and all that. So, let us say what is hypothesis testing, let us look at that. Suppose uh, there is a sentence uh, which says blinking lights show danger. On a system, for example, there may be a red light which is blinking. Now, this sentence linguistically can be broken down into two phrases, blinking lights and show danger. So, there is a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So, this sentence uh, includes a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and this is the parsing of that sentence into the phrases. Now, what are the uh, propositions involved here? So, propositions are in the form of those categories, subject, predicate, etc. And we say lights are blinking. This is a proposition. Lights are blinking is a proposition. And show danger. So, a proposition consists of subject, predicate, and here also it is a predicate. So, this sentence, this printed text, which is a sentence, is syntactically analyzed into two phrases, a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And then, it is semantically analyzed for semantic interpretation. Semantic means meaning. To arrive at the meaning, it is now analyzed into two propositions. So, finally, we get meaning from here, from these propositions. If this, prop so if assume that this proposition is true, that a light is blinking, then there is danger, right? So, we have got the meaning and this meaning is basically what I am saying is that there is a, now propositions is a very general statement. Uh, when we say hypothesis testing, we should not again confuse it with statistical hypothesis. So, there is nothing like probabilistic here. Here, what we are saying is it is true or it is false. So, it is a dichotomous situation and what we are saying is that there is a proposition, light is blinking on a system, red light or whatever, that uh, we have not gone into that detail, but and then show danger. So, so, given that light is blinking, light blinking is one hypothesis. Next is 
uh, a uh, you know a show danger that I test and that I get the meaning of the sentence. So hypothesis testing is the operator tests the truth value of p2 in the context of p1. That is hypothesis testing. p1 is some hypothesis that has that is formed on the basis of that sentence, which is available in the operator's working memory. So the role of working memory becomes very important. And we'll look at the uh, understanding or meaning of the working memory, which is a very short-lived memory unless some kind of rehearsal is done. <clears throat> then the truth value finally establishes the meaning. So if there's a truth value, so if the light is not blinking, there's no truth value, and therefore uh, no meaning is established. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. Due to its capacity limitation, working memory can retain up to four propositions, not many propositions. Now this is uh, providing in uh, a, an important approach toward writing guidelines. The sentences shouldn't be long. They shouldn't contain more than three or four propositions. This provides an important guideline for the length of a sentence. Then unitization is application. <coughs> unitization is automatic, automation of the processing of uh, or bottom up processing. A long perceptual experience is required. Unitization, uh, utilization enhances uh, this is unitization, is used as unitization. Enhances speed and accuracy of recognition. And training on unitization of critical information. For example, critical signals in a patient, in a nuclear plant, etc., can be useful. So basically what this unitization is suggesting, it's not confined only to language, but to the situations also. For a surgeon, for example, if there are critical signals while doing a surgery in the patient, then there should be a lot of training on that. So that automatically the surgeon can see that there's a problem. Similarly on the nuclear plant, you know. Now this is uh, how the uh, context data trade-off comes about. So let's take this example. So let's take a simple uh, example. Let's say either a single word, traffic, or a complete uh, statement will encounter traffic jam. So suppose you read this signal and on a display when you're driving, it says traffic. Or it says will encounter traffic jam. Now given a window, how clearly can the data be presented? If the message is small, traffic, then a larger font size can be used. Print size can be larger. But if we want to include too much material in that small window, then the font size will have to be reduced. And several other things. So these, this determines the quality. Uh, this, this determines the um, quality of the information that we are presenting. So here, the uh, data quality is large, and here uh, data quality is small. And then we can have top-down processes. Say, so bottom-up processing, data quality is in terms of large print and small print. Top-down processing in terms of many words, high context, and uh, fewer words, low context. So this is a low context. And this is a high context. And now we can see that what kind of relationship is there. So when the, in the, uh, when the bottom up data quality is high, then the uh, usable information is large. Because uh, in one glimpse, that information can be achieved. But when the, uh, there are many words, so data quality is gone down, then the in usable information is less. So the quality of the data, if it is high, it is good, usable information is high, etc. But the bottom, the, the top-down processes go in the opposite direction. So top-down context quality, contextual redundancy, for example. There's, there's no redundancy here. There's a 
some level of redundancy which is much better than that. So, if it is high context printed text, then the, uh, this is the variation in usable information. And if it is low context, isolated word setting uh, for traffic only, for example. So, this is high context or redundancy and this is isolated word. So, when only traffic is written, then this is the usable information. So, one can see that the usable information is higher if the context is higher. So, one has to uh, find an optimum solution how much information to present and uh, combine so that uh, we get an optimum level of usable information. Now, then there is sentence processing speed. What is the speed with which we process the information? While talking about human performance, we talked about these the issues, error, speed, uh, usability of information, etc. So, suppose we have a picture like this uh, where there is a triangle and there is a cross and uh, they are arranged in the vertical direction. Then we can construct four types of sentences. True affirmative, the triangle is about the cross. This is a true affirmative. It is true because triangle is about the cross and it is affirmative sentence. The cross is about the triangle. It is a false affirmative. It is an affirmative sentence, but it is false of the situation of the picture. So, it is a picture verification task basically. The triangle is not about the cross is a false negative and the cross is not about the triangle, it is a true negative. So, there is a lot of research to show that the time taken to process affirmative sentences is less as compared to the time taken for processing negative sentences and this again provides a Im very important idea about framing guidelines. We should avoid negative sentences in framing guidelines because they are, uh, they are slower to be processed and they are difficult also to be processed. I am not going to that theoretical interpretation explanation of the research findings, but that is a general finding. So, basically positive sentences are processed and understood faster than negative sentences and these are some uh, findings of this particular study. You can look at the reference toward the end. So, affirmative sentences latency is the time taken to understand, comprehend correctly for those sentences compared to the picture, then we can see that affirmative sentences are faster, they take less time, whereas negative sentences are slower, they are taking more time. And within that, the general sequence is that there is a true affirmative, take the least time, then false affirmative, then false negative and then true negatives. So, true negatives are really the most difficult and uh, they are the slowest ones to be processed. There are some further studies uh, where you know uh, more findings are there to support that. I will uh, not go into that, but uh, it depends whether we present sentence first or picture first. This also makes a difference. So, if uh, the instruction goes continuously on two pages, whether we present picture on the first page and sentences on the second page or the other way around. So, basically suppose there is a uh, window where a signal comes up, a light for example, and then the message comes up or if the message comes before the signal. So, blinking light and we show the blinking light, <coughs> we show the blinking light and then the message comes up. Even this influences this order in which the sentence and the picture are presented, that also affects the speed of processing and uh, these two diagrams just show that. <coughs> so, here it is uh, true positives, then uh, false positives and then false negatives and true negatives when uh, the uh, sentence is presented first. But when the picture is pres presented first, then uh, we can see that immediately uh, there is some uh, distinction between these two pictures. 
then some people have tried to understand uh, what will be the effects of stimulus degradation. Stimulus degradation means either the uh, there is uh, the illumination is low or the distorted there are, there are images which are distorted and uh, or uh, there is a vibration present all these can degrade a particular stimulus. So, uh, and you know here uh, what is shown is that a clear stimulus is processed faster than the degraded stimulus. So, it is very important that illumination level, contrast, etc., are to be presented in a particular order. Then, you know, these can be applied to economy and security in code design. We have talked about economy and security while talking about information theory. There is a particular principle called the Shannon Fano principle, which says that more of most the, the information will be presented most efficiently, or a code will be most efficient when the length of the text is proportional to the information content. So, that is called Shannon Fano principle, and its application is in the form of Ziff's law in natural languages, uh, where you know it said that uh, words that occur frequently are short. For example, off to, and these occur much more frequently. So, if you took a uh, several textual materials and you counted the number of uh, words with different lengths, you will find that uh, shorter words have a higher frequency of occurrence. So, basically, high priority low information messages should be short and low priority ones should be long. So, if it is a uh, high priority and uh, low information message, then do not waste time and space in that. You know. But if it is a low priority and therefore, it is more informative. We have already seen in information theory that as the priority reduces, then the information goes up. So, these are the guidelines for writing instructions. Use simple affirmative sentences. Use words which are simple, short, concrete. Concrete means imagery can be generated. Use simple grammatical constructions, SVO. Support verbal instructions with images wherever feasible. Minimize the use of pronouns because they can be confusing. They can be uh, referring a pronoun, pronoun here can refer to a distant noun or something. Use verbs instead of nouns. So, give consideration to replace it by consider. Present instructions in a logical order. Guidelines for integrated text and picture instructions. You know, we have already seen the uh, proximity principle or uh, the, you know, uh, the uh, proximity compatibility principle we already seen. And spatial contiguity, closeness, neighborhood is a derivative of that particular compatibility principle. So, if the text is presented along with the particular control, then uh, that will be much more meaningful and easy to understand. And dual presentation improves learning, memory, and accuracy of the response. So, this is just an example uh, where you know how the dual presentation helps. Uh, when dual presentation is there, image and uh, words, verbal representation and imaginary representations will be there, and uh, the words can refer to the image and get a referential connection or referential meaning. So, it becomes much more meaningful images are better to remember and hold for a longer duration. This is just an example where you know uh, for how to use an iron for example. So, it is a steam iron, it is a steam iron. So, uh, first step is fill water here, second step is set choice whatever uh, fabric you are using, third is connect to the mains, fourth is start ironing when the red light goes off and fifth is press this button if you need steam. So, these are just, just to indicate you know how we can integrate and this is very meaningful and can be understood very easily as to which particular operation is to be carried out. Advantage of multimodality instructions is written text, images, spoken utterances and visible actions have different but complementary strengths. Appropriately linking words to images make the message more effective. Supporting voice with appropriate concurrent facial gestures and actions creates positive impact. Under uncertain environmental conditions, for example, poor visibility, redundancy between text and voice is useful. So, we are presenting information in a redundant manner. Guidelines for product warning, the user must uh, notice the warning first of all, 
The user must read the warning, legibility, it should be legible, written in large print. The user must be able to understand uh, the warning, linguistic considerations, what kind of sentence structure should be used. The user must comply with the warning, cost of compliance. So these are just some examples taken from the uh, everyday life. So <coughs> for cigarettes, smoking kills, and for medicine, may cause dizziness, and then what to do. And then toothpaste, uh, directions for use, and what happens if children uh, overuse it. And then uh, on our laptops or the TV, uh, on the computer screen, we get these messages sometimes, the battery is running low, 10%, whatever, and therefore it tells to plug, plug in the uh, device and uh, the, or stop working, shut down the computer. So basically what we have done in this session is that Sentence comprehension involves bottom-up and top-down cognitive processes, and these processes go on simultaneously. Longer or more the experience in a particular test, then better, faster, more accurate is the performance. So operators have to be trained there, and because you know uh, we, we have already seen, for example, in unit, unitization. Unitization is an important consideration in almost any, on any system. Understanding the meaning of a sentence can be explained on the basis of hypothesis testing. We have looked at how the propositions are formed to arrive at the meaning of a particular word. And the, so that may be called a propositional meaning, but um, that's for linguistic discussion. Basically, we are not looking into that. So the idea is that a sentence is analyzed into uh, certain grammatical categories, uh, say noun phrase, verb phrase, and that is further analyzed into propositions, uh, which lead us to get the meaning. Then cognitive research on sentence verification and other processes makes important contribution to developing instructional guides. So we should be, uh, you know, very careful. There are simple things, you know, for example, how many words, sentence, how long should the sentences be? Because of the memory limitation of integrating information, although it's been said that uh, four propositions, not more than four propositions and all that. Uh, generally, you know, a general guideline is that don't use sentences in printed form, which are longer than 16 words, let's say. And in spoken addresses, not more than seven words. So, uh, you know, the span of comprehension, uh, sentence comprehension will depend upon what is the span of comprehension of human beings. Span of comprehension is uh, about seven chunks. Uh, we look at the concept of chunk uh, and uh, etc. in the next session when we talk about memory. So these are some questions for discussion. The feature extraction model discussed in this session is related to word recognition and we have taken only the printed text. Word recognition ha is happening there. Does this process exist for nonverbal material? or for objects, for example. So for this object, for example, uh, can I use feature analysis? Objects have features. So there may be uh, round surfaces, uh, rectangular surfaces, so angular or circular surfaces, for example. Uh, circular features may be present or angular features may be present. Uh, and so is it possible to analyze or to break down an object into its smallest features? And uh, these features may be present. For example, the uh, English alphabet consists of uh, those 26 letters, and then uh, all of them can be represented in the form of certain features. So that feature uh, set defines the universe uh, for the letters um, in the English alphabet. Similarly, in any, any other languages, that can happen. So does it hold for objects? So that is uh, what Biedermann tried to do. Um, he applied uh, feature analysis to the op to objects, non nonverbal objects, and uh, the concept uh, that he gave was called geons. So it's a Biedermann's geon theory is based on a computational theory. 
So geoms as geometric features suggested by Biedermann to recognize a table with an oval shaped top. So if there is an oval shaped top table, table with that, what are the features? This is a very simple example, but one can take very complex examples, a jug, a mug, a chair for example, a car, right? So what are those basic elementary features? Biedermann has identified those. Second question is, as a cognitive ergonomist, how will you ensure that users will comply with the warning while using a product? So yeah, warning is there. But will the users comply? If they don't comply, who is responsible? Will the manufacturer be sued? Or is it the responsibility of the user? Once, for example, the manufacturer says, oh, I have announced this, I have dictated this, I have printed this, etc. And suppose a user still uh, meets an accident or doesn't follow the instructions, then who is responsible? This can be an important question. We'll not go into that right now. But the, you know, so what can be done? For example, uh, one way is to put some cost on non-compliance. Okay, the government, for example, at times uh, puts cost on uh, not wearing a helmet, for example, uh, while driving a two-wheeler on the road, uh, then wearing a helmet is a law, almost. So the violators are fined. They are fined and uh, they are, uh, you know, th there is some punishment also for that. Then uh, discuss the language production and comprehension as complementary processes. We have not looked at uh, these two as, com we have to look only at language comprehension. What about production? Because uh, any uh, leader or any person who is controlling a particular unit in, of individuals who are working on a system would also like to give instructions. And therefore, uh, the leader has to produce certain utterances, words, sentences, or whatever. So what about the production processes? So you should try to understand the complementarity between language comprehension and language production and an analysis of the auditory or verbal or spoken messages will help you in that direction. Finally, uh, there is, uh, these are references uh, which can go through and which uh, information from where has been used in this presentation. Thank you very much for today.